Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to live in a haunted house? Well, it turns out that quite a few people are actually considering it these days especially if it means getting a great deal on a home. In fact, nearly half of Americans say they would be willing to share their space with a ghost or two if it meant scoring a discounted mortgage rate. Tonight, we'll take a creepy tour of homes to some of the most notorious haunted houses that were recently up for grabs. We've got everything from the super-creepy Amityville Horror House to the stunning Soudan House, which was designed by the famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright but has a pretty dark history. And if you're looking for a place that's been legally declared haunted, check out the Ackley House in New York. But it's not all about the scares. Some of these homes, like the Pillars Estate and the Ann Starrett Mansion, are just downright gorgeous, even if they do come with a few ghostly roommates. And if you're a fan of the Conjuring movies, you might be interested in the real-life Conjuring house that inspired the franchise. So. If you're house hunting, a thrill seeker, or just curious about the stories behind these haunted homes, stick around as we explore some of the most haunted properties recently on the housing market. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… The Nazca Lines of Peru span for miles and are visible only from the sky. These mysterious designs have sparked theories ranging from astronomical markers to extraterrestrial landing strips, challenging our understanding of ancient civilizations. We'll look at the mystery behind them and consider a few theories for their existence. Armin Muse placed a personal ad for a volunteer. He was looking for someone to give themselves over to him. To eat. It's one of the most infamous cases of modern cannibalism. On May 28, 1903, Dr. Francis J. Tumblety, a man with surgical skills and a deep-seated hatred for women, died in St. Louis. Intriguingly, Tumblety was in London during the gruesome Jack the Ripper murders in 1888, sparking speculation that he might be the infamous slasher. Imagine a duel between two women, one a princess, the other a countess. Now. Picture them both brandishing swords, slashing at each other. And now picture them doing so topless. It really happened, and the reason for the duel? A disagreement over flower arrangements. But first, are you brave enough to live in a haunted house? If so, and you're ready to make a move, you might find a good deal in one of the homes I'm about to tell you about. Now, bolt your doors. Lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. A house can become haunted for any number of reasons. Some spirits seemingly become trapped after suffering a violent or tragic event in life, forever chaining them to the scene of their death. Other hauntings result from poor location planning, such as a building being built too close to, or even on top of, cemeteries or old burial grounds. Depending on the type of building, lingering spirits may be stuck in a perpetual loop, forever reliving a moment in time, while others are more interactive, moving objects, or even attacking new occupants. That's not to say living with ghosts is always scary. Certain families claim to feel a sense of calm or even warmth and comfort upon spotting apparitions. About 60% of Americans claim they don't believe in ghosts, 
but only 17% of the population would be willing to live in a house known to be haunted. At least, that was the case before inflation rates soared and the dream of owning a home became increasingly unattainable for many. The number of people willing to share their halls with a ghost rose to 46% if the house came at a significantly discounted rate. Living with slamming doors and the occasional book flying across the room doesn't seem so bad if it comes in tandem with low mortgage rates. Not everyone is offered the luxury of knowing their house is haunted before moving in, however, and in some cases that results in an entire family abandoning their home in the middle of the night. But for the horror hunters who purposely seek out the thrill of hearing something go bump in the night, here are several haunted houses that have recently hit the housing market. The Enzelin House Thrill seekers had the chance to own their very own speakeasy that comes with at least nine ghosts. The beautiful split-level colonial oozes charm and may not seem like your typical haunted house, but longtime homeowner Michelle Bell knows all about its spectral tenants. The Enzelin House has been in Bell's family for six generations, and she has been connecting with the spirits since she was a child. Bell was able to rekindle the connection when she returned to the home to care for her ailing mother. Since returning, Bell has awoken each night at 3 a.m. to loud footsteps in the hallways and has gone through 13 caregivers. All 13 have quit after witnessing shapes resembling three tall men roaming the house. While Bell has fond memories of the Enzelin house, she has learned to keep the basement locked. The home has been featured on multiple paranormal shows, which captured orbs flying and odd shadows. Bell originally listed the horror-filled home for $444,444 because it's an angelic symbolism of protection, she said, but she has since dropped the price. The Saladin House Frank Lloyd Wright left his mark all over Los Angeles, from the avant-garde orchestral shells of the Hollywood Bowl to Wayfarer's Chapel in Palos Verdes to the Otto Bowman House in the Hollywood Hills. The architect helped shape one of the world's most iconic cities. However, one of Wright's creations has a darker, potentially murderous past. In 1927, retired artist John Soudan and his wife Ruth commissioned Lloyd to design a unique home that would dazzle guests and become an epicenter for entertainment. The result was an extravagant Mayan revival-style fortress constructed with elaborately designed textile blocks. Every room has access to the central courtyard, filled with exotic plants, and its design made it the definition of privacy. The home's next owner, Dr. George Hoodell, allegedly used that privacy for nefarious purposes. Known for being a creepy character, Hoodle threw hedonistic parties filled with drugs and sexual assault. According to his son, retired LAPD detective Steve Hoodle, George Hodel also murdered multiple people in the Soudan house, including the infamous Black Dahlia, 22-year-old Elizabeth Short. George Hodel fled the country before proper investigations could be completed, but whatever evil energies he reportedly brought into the house remained. The Soudan house has sold multiple times after originally being listed for $3.85 million in 2011. It sold for $6.1 million in 2022. The Ackley House New York may be best known for tales of the Headless Horseman, but it's also home to the first house to be legally declared haunted. Like many haunted houses, one Levada place is a sprawling Victorian. Residing in the town of Nyack, New York, the home boasts eight rooms, a wraparound porch, a fenced-in pool, and multiple alleged apparitions. The home's previous owners, George and Wendy Ackley, have reported seeing a pair of disembodied moccasin-clad feet walking down hallways and a man wearing colonial or Revolutionary War attire. They'd also find multiple little trinkets and coins around their home. Unlike most stories featuring a family moving into a haunted house, the Ackleys had a cordial, even friendly relationship with their ghosts. One spirit would even gently wake up their daughter before school every morning. While the family had no issues with their harmonious haunting, they decided to downsize and put their house on the market for $800,000, a decision that placed them in surprising legal trouble. 
The trouble began after a young couple purchased the Ackley House in 1989. Although the house passed a physical inspection, the Stambovskys became upset when they found out about the haunting from a neighbor. The couple claimed the Ackleys never told them about the home's paranormal history, which would have stopped them from going through with the purchase. What followed was a legal battle that went to the New York Supreme Court, which had to decide whether homeowners legally had to disclose their homes as haunted. In what came to be known as the Ghostbuster ruling, Justice Israel Rubin ruled that they did. The Stambovskys were able to back out of their purchase, but even after being declared legally haunted, the Ackley House had no issue selling. Numerous families owned it before it was sold again in 2021 for $1.8 million. The Amityville Horror House On November 13, 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. claimed to give in to the sinister whispers of 108 Ocean Avenue and murdered his family. Five people lost their lives in one of the most grisly crimes in Long Island's history. Even with its gruesome past, the five-bedroom, three-and-a-half-bath Dutch colonial was too good a bargain for the Lutz family to pass up. They moved into the home in December 1975. Twenty-eight days later, the Lutz family fled the home in the middle of the night, claiming demonic forces attacked them. Their claim brought more notoriety to the Amityville house, drawing the attention of spiritualists and even renowned but later debunked demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren. Claims of demons with glowing red eyes weren't enough to keep people out. Four homeowners have lived in the home since the Lutz family left, and so far, none have run out of the house screaming. Real estate agent Nancy Taylor Bubes claims murder isn't a deal-breaker for most people. When you deliver a product that doesn't feel like a murder happened inside, buyers look at it with fresh eyes. You've washed away the sadness. While stories of ghosts and demons may not prevent people from moving in, they may affect the price. The Amityville house was purchased for $900,000 in 2010, was listed for $850,000 in 2016, and sold for $605,000 in 2017. The Pillars Estate a 19th century Victorian with hand-carved doors, fireplaces, and windows selling for $500,000 sounds like a steal, even if the house is haunted. Tony McMurdy spent 11 years restoring the grandiose Gothic Victorian to its original and perhaps spooky grandeur. As it's one of the oldest houses in the country, McMurdy took care to preserve its original features, including an antique key used to enter the sprawling six-bedroom mansion. Inside, heavy burgundy drapes, grandfather clocks, and winding staircases transport visitors back in time and may introduce them to several ghosts rumored to still live in the home. The ghosts, like the golden sconces and chandeliers, are just part of the added charm. Would it even be a true Victorian without a few spectral moans? Whispers of ghosts began during the restoration. One of McMurdy's family members saw a child peering from a basement window and a workman claimed to have heard a child speaking to him, but swore no one else was around. An even more hair-raising tale claims a woman in white inhabits one of the bedrooms, and multiple staff members claim mysterious footsteps have followed them up the stairs. Having no ghostly encounters himself, McMurdy was hopeful when he put the Pillars estate on the market for $1 million in 2015. Even with all the history and antiques inside, McMurdy had to slash the price to $500,000 before settling on $450,000 in 2010. Perhaps the candelabras and intricate cherubic carvings were a little too creepy when paired with the visage of shadowy children looking through the windows. The George Champlin Mason House Built in 1873 by renowned architect George Champlin Mason as his private home, the George Champlin Mason House is considered special, thoughtful, and well-designed. The house is so special, in fact, the architect allegedly didn't want to leave even after he died. Former owners Brian Handley and Nicholas Mayone reported numerous unnatural encounters in the 15 years they resided there. The pair reported smelling unexplained cigarette smoke at 2 a.m., seeing a woman in Victorian attire on the stairs, and even witnessing Mason walk into the house. Thankfully, every supposedly supernatural encounter has largely been positive. 
The Bed and Breakfast, peppered with the paranormal, was listed for $4.5 million in 2021 before being taken off the market. The Dunsmere Victorian Regal and often colorful, Victorian houses are one of California's most sought-after styles. Buyers love the intricate architecture, old charm, and intriguing history. One Victorian in Dunsmar, California came with more than architecture and charm, allegedly. It also came with ghosts. Dating back to 1911, 5957 Sacramento Avenue started with a mortuary on the first floor. Tools, including a gurney, were still in the home when Brad Warner purchased it in 2015. And if that's not creepy enough, he also claimed the basement contained the skeletal remains of a 17-year-old girl. With all the bodies that passed through the first-floor mortuary, it's unsurprising the home has a history of doors slamming on their own, flames snuffing themselves out, rolling power outages, and a disembodied hand pressing against the bathroom's privacy glass. Warner had so many paranormal experiences in the home, he and his wife decided to turn the Victorian into a dead and breakfast. The dark attraction was waylaid by divorce and put up for sale in 2015 for $899,000. Unfortunately for Warner, the dead and breakfast's grim history may have kept prospective buyers away, as the home ultimately sold for $300,000, only to go right back onto the market for $100,000. Hopefully the new owners are ready to handle whatever still lingers in the halls. The Conjuring House Some houses are so haunted, prospective owners have to sign waivers before completing their purchase. One house, located at 1677 Round Top Road in Burlville, Rhode Island, is a quaint three-bedroom, two-bath farmhouse that sits on nearly nine acres. It also has a history of ghosts throwing people out of beds random smells of rotting meat, and the spirit of a witch with a penchant for possessing family members. The malevolent forces were so evil, they inspired one of Hollywood's most popular franchises, The Conjuring. The Conjuring House has a history of intense paranormal activity, ranging from the benign to the dangerous. Since the Perrin family moved out in the 1970s, subsequent owners have not reported anything too sinister, even after opening the home to the public. Corey and Jennifer Heinzen, who purchased the home for $439,000 in 2019, turned the house into a supernatural experience, allowing guests to become paranormal investigators for the night. Corey Heinzen said they've experienced doors open on their own, footsteps, disembodied voices, electronic voice phenomena, and some awesome spirit box sessions during their tenure as homeowners and tour leaders. While the spirits that dwelled within 1677 Round Top Road have been relatively peaceful, the Heinzens are still hesitant to allow new owners to live in the house year-round when they put it on the market. It's a warning Jacqueline Nunez heeded when she purchased the home for an unprecedented $1.5 million in 2021, 27% over the asking price. Nunez has already experienced encounters with some of the alleged spirits with whom she shares her home. Nunez claims she spoke to several spirits with the help of ghost hunters and heard heavy footsteps on the staircase. The Ann Starrett Mansion Many ghosts are drawn to places of sorrow, forever chained to sinister secrets of the past. Some spirits, however, are drawn to certain homes due to a lifetime of positivity and joy there. The Ann Starrett Mansion was a true labor of love. George Starrett built the Victorian-style house in 1889 as a monument to his wife Anne and spared no expense in expressing his adoration. The nine-bedroom mansion is a craftsman's dream, featuring a free-floating spiral staircase that still baffles architects today and peaks inside a solar solarium. With all the warmth put into every artistic detail, it's no wonder George and Anne can still be found admiring their favorite places in the house. Purchased in 1986 from the Starrett family for $264,000, 744 Clay Street in Port Townsend, Washington was transformed into a bed and breakfast. Numerous guests have reported seeing George, Anne, their descendants, and a dedicated nanny during their stays. Only the nanny has been reported to interact with guests, tidying up and turning off the lights if they've been left on too long. All ghosts are said to exude a peaceful, 
calming, and even welcoming energy. In 2022, the Ann Starrett Mansion was for sale at $1.5 million. The Priestley House Built in 1852, the Priestley House is an opulent piece of American history. The Greek Revival predates the Civil War, and its original features give buyers a glimpse of an authentic antebellum experience. Designed by the town's first doctor, James Priestley, the mansion took 62 years to complete. Perhaps all the time and dedication is why his spirit and that of his wife allegedly still reside in the house. Past owners of the Priestley house have experienced multiple paranormal experiences, ranging from random objects falling to the floor to the piano playing on its own and a woman's ghostly figure roaming its halls. In 2022, the Priestley house was for sale for $938,000. The Charming Forge Mansion Nothing says charming old cottage like fluted columns, original colonial woodwork, and a history of paranormal encounters. Familial additions have transformed the charming Forge Mansion from an iron forge to a seven-bedroom, four-bath mansion that sits on 48.5 acres. The stone structure features a four-car garage, not to mention several ghosts allegedly roaming the grounds. The permanent inhabitants include a woman mourning a tragic love, forever crying in her bedroom while her headless beloved roams the road leading to the mansion. German prisoners of war from the American Revolution crying out in the middle of the night, and numerous other apparitions who stomp around the old forge. The sound of phantoms moaning may not be the most sought-after ambiance, but at least they come with an amazing view. The forge's previous owner didn't report any ghostly sightings, but perhaps they kept their stories close to heart considering they had to drop the price five times before selling. Though they purchased the house for $2.5 million in 2009, they dropped the price to $650,000 in 2019. While haunted houses might not be for everyone, they do offer a unique blend of history, mystery, and thrill that can be irresistibly attractive to some. Who knows, maybe living with a ghost or two isn't so bad after all especially if it comes with a good story and a great deal on the price. Up next, the Nazca Lines of Peru span for miles and are visible only from the sky. These mysterious designs have sparked theories ranging from astronomical markers to extraterrestrial landing strips, challenging our understanding of ancient civilizations. We'll look at the mystery behind them and consider a few theories for their existence. Plus, on May 28, 1903, Dr. Francis J. Tumblety, a man with surgical skills and a deep-seated hatred for women, died in St. Louis. Intriguingly, Tumblety was in London during the gruesome Jack the Ripper murders in 1888, sparking speculation that he might be the infamous slasher. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Since their discovery in the mid-20th century, the Nazca Lines in Peru have captivated researchers, historians, and the general public with their enigmatic purpose and origin. These geoglyphs sprawling across over 170 square miles of the Nazca Desert include a vast array of precisely straight lines, intricate shapes, and figures of animals and humans. 
The fact that these designs are best viewed from the sky adds to their mystery, as they were created long before human flight was conceivable. Could these lines suggest a time when an advanced civilization, possibly spanning the globe, existed far earlier than our current historical records indicate? The Nazca Lines, thought to have been created between 500 BC and 500 AD, are a series of large geoglyphs made by removing the reddish pebbles that cover the surface of the Nazca Desert to reveal the whitish ground beneath. These images range from simple lines to intricate designs of animals, plants, and humanoid figures. The most famous among these is the hummingbird, monkey, spider, and the enigmatic astronaut, which bears a striking resemblance to a human figure in a spacesuit. The precision and scale of these geoglyphs have led to numerous theories about their purpose and creators. Some believe they were created for astronomical purposes, as many of the lines align with constellations. Others propose they were part of water rituals, created to invoke the gods to bring rain to this arid region. One of the most intriguing theories about the Nazca Lines is that they were created by or for extraterrestrial beings. Proponents of the ancient astronaut theory such as Eric von Däniken suggest that the geoglyphs were designed as landing strips for alien spacecraft or messages to beings in the sky. This theory gains some traction due to the presence of long, straight lines that stretch for miles, which could feasibly serve as landing guides for aircraft. Supporters of this theory also point to the Quimbaya artifacts found in Colombia which resemble modern airplanes. These small gold figurines have been dated to around 1000 AD, and some believe they depict advanced flying machines used by an ancient civilization or extraterrestrial visitors. Another theory suggests that the Nazca Lines, along with other ancient sites in Peru, were part of a vast industrial complex. Some researchers propose that the lines and surrounding structures were used for large-scale mining operations, extracting valuable minerals from the Earth. The lines might have served as markers or guides for these operations, and the geoglyphs could have been a form of ancient industrial art or religious expression related to these activities. Support for this theory comes from the discovery of changes in electromagnetic energy and higher-than-normal electrical conductivity at certain points along the lines. These findings suggest that the area may have been used for some form of large-scale operation that involved manipulating the Earth's natural resources. The Nazca Lines are not the only mysterious geoglyphs in the world. Similar creations, such as the Serpent Mound in Ohio, also seem to have connections to ancient astronomical and possibly industrial activities. These similarities hint at a broader, perhaps even global, connection between ancient civilizations that shared knowledge and techniques for creating these massive earthworks. In the Americas, legends speak of a great civilization that predated the known indigenous cultures. These legends often mention beings with advanced knowledge who came from the stars or other worlds, teaching the local people and helping them build incredible structures. These beings are sometimes described as the Viracocas in South American legends. I might be butchering that word. They were pale-skinned, bearded figures who brought wisdom and technology to the ancient people. One of the most intriguing sites in Peru is Hayumarca, known as the Gate of the Gods. This rock formation, discovered by a local tour guide, features a large, door-like structure that, according to legend, allowed the gods to pass between worlds. The legend of Amaru Maru, an Incan high priest who escaped the Spanish invasion through this gateway, adds to the site's mystique. According to the legend, Maru used a golden disc, the Key of the Gods of the Seven Rays, to activate the gateway, which opened a shimmering tunnel of blue light. This tale, while fantastical, resonates with many other legends of portals and gateways found in ancient cultures worldwide. In recent years, discoveries in Peru have continued to fuel speculation about the origins of the Nazca Lines and their creators. In 2017, journalist Jamie Masson announced the discovery of a mummified body that he claimed could be of extraterrestrial origin. This body, with three fingers and toes, did not match any known species in the fossil record. While initial analyses dated the body to between 245 and 410 AD, the unusual anatomy 
led some researchers to consider the possibility of an alien connection. Dr. Raimundo Salas Alfaro, who performed CAT scans on the mummy, and Dr. Konstantin Korodkov, who analyzed its carbon dating, both supported the authenticity of the find. However, the World Congress on Mummy Studies has called for further investigation, suggesting the possibility of a hoax. The Nazca Lines, along with other megalithic sites in Peru such as Machu Picchu and Sacsayhuaman, showcase advanced building techniques and astronomical knowledge that challenge our understanding of ancient civilizations. These sites, with their precise alignments and massive stone constructions, suggest that the people who built them possessed sophisticated engineering skills and a deep understanding of the cosmos. Graham Hancock, in his book Fingerprints of the Gods, explores the idea that a lost civilization predating the known cultures of the Americas may have been responsible for these incredible feats. He draws parallels between the Viracocas and similar figures in other ancient cultures, such as the Anunnaki of Mesopotamia and the mysterious builders of the Egyptian pyramids. Despite the many theories, the true purpose of the Nazca Lines remains a mystery. They may have served multiple functions, from religious and astronomical to industrial and navigational. The sheer scale and complexity of these geoglyphs, visible only from the sky, continue to captivate and puzzle researchers. Whether the lines were meant to communicate with the gods, mark important astronomical events, or guide ancient aircraft, their creation required a level of organization and skill that suggests a highly advanced society. The possibility that this society had connections to other ancient civilizations around the world adds another layer of intrigue to the story. As researchers continue to explore these geoglyphs and other ancient sites, we may one day uncover the true purpose and origins of these incredible creations. For now, the Nazca Lines remain one of the world's greatest archaeological enigmas. Whether they were created for ancient astronauts, lost civilizations, or simply the skilled hands of the Nazca people, the lines continue to inspire awe and wonder in all who study them. The variety of theories about the Nazca Lines, from astronomical markers to landing strips for ancient aircraft, highlight the human desire to understand the unknown. These theories, while diverse, share a common thread. They all point to a level of sophistication and purpose that challenges our current understanding of ancient cultures. The idea that the Nazca Lines could be related to a global ancient civilization, possibly connected to other enigmatic sites around the world, is particularly intriguing. This theory suggests that ancient people had far more advanced knowledge and capabilities than we often give them credit for. Modern technology, such as satellite imagery and ground-penetrating radar, has allowed researchers to study the Nazca Lines in greater detail than ever before. These tools have revealed new geoglyphs and provided insights into the construction techniques used by the Nazca people. As technology continues to advance, it may help us unlock even more secrets about these ancient creations. In addition to technological advancements, interdisciplinary collaboration among archaeologists, historians, and scientists is crucial for piecing together the puzzle of the Nazca Lines. By combining expertise from various fields, researchers can develop a more comprehensive understanding of these geoglyphs and their significance. On May 28, 1903, a very strange man died in St. Louis. His name was Dr. Francis J. Tumblety, and he had a passionate hatred for women, surgical skills, and happened to be in London, England in 1888, at the same time that the mysterious killer known as Jack the Ripper was murdering prostitutes in the city's East End. Was Tumblety, as some believe, Jack the Ripper? In the year 1888, the city of London, England was terrorized by a killer who called himself Jack the Ripper. The madman prowled the streets of the Whitechapel district in East London and slaughtered a number of prostitutes, carving his way into the historical record as the first modern serial killer. As the years have passed, 
The Ripper has held the morbid curiosity of professional and amateur sleuths, armchair detectives, and crime buffs alike. Having eluded capture in the 1880s, his identity has been debated ever since, and scores of suspects have emerged, with a number of Americans among them. Many St. Louisans have been surprised over the years to find that one of the suspects lived in St. Louis and died there 15 years after the murders in London stopped. Suspicion by police officials that Dr. Francis J. Tumblety may have been Jack the Ripper came about in 1913, years after the murders took place. Inspector John Littlechild, head of the special branch in England, surmised that Tumblety might have been the killer. As he told a journalist, his feelings toward women were remarkable and bitter in the extreme, a fact on record. Tumblety was arrested at the time of the murders in connection with unnatural offenses and charged at Marlboro Street, remanded on bail, jumped his bail, and got away to Bologna. He shortly left Bologna and was never heard of afterward. It's believed that he committed suicide, but certain it is that from the time the Ripper murders came to an end. And while not all of Inspector Littlechild's facts were correct, he did make an interesting case toward the American doctor being the fiendish killer. Francis J. Tumblety was born in Canada in 1833 and moved with his family to Rochester, New York at a very young age. Although uneducated, he was a clever man and became wealthy and successful as a homeopath and a mixer of patent medicines. There's no record as to whether these snake oil cures worked or not, but it is certain that Tumblety held no medical degree. He did claim to possess Indian and Oriental secrets of healing, and he was described as charming and handsome, so it's not surprising that he made quite a bit of money in this questionable field. When not charming customers, Tumblety was said to have been disliked by many for his self-aggrandizing and his constant boasting. He had a penchant for staying in fine hotels, wearing fine clothes, and making false claims about himself. Often these tall tales got him into trouble, and he left town on more than one occasion just to step ahead of the law. In the late 1850s and early 1860s, Tumblety was living in Washington, D.C., and from this period, the first stories of his deep-seated hatred for women began to surface. During a dinner party one night in 1861, Tumblety was asked by some guests why he did not invite any single women to the gathering. Tumblety replied that women were nothing more than cattle and that he would rather give a friend poison than see him with a woman. He then began to speak about the evils of women, especially prostitutes. A man who was in attendance that evening, an attorney named C. A. Dunham, later remarked that it was believed that Tumblety had been tricked into marriage by a woman who was later revealed to be a prostitute. This was thought to have sparked his hatred of women, but none of the guests had any idea just how far the feelings of animosity went until Tumblety offered to show them his collection. He led his guests into a back study of the house where he kept his anatomical museum. Here, they were shown row after row of jars containing women's uteruses. In 1863, Tumblety came to St. Louis for the first time and took rooms at the Lindell Hotel. As he recounted in his letters, his flamboyant ways did not appeal to those in St. Louis, and he claimed to have been arrested in both the city and in the Carondelet, an independent city at that time, for putting on airs and being caught in quasi-military dress. His biggest flaw in those troubled times in St. Louis were his apparent Southern sympathies. In 1865, he was arrested on the serious charge of what amounted to an early case of biological terrorism. Federal officers had him arrested after he was allegedly involved in a plot to infect blankets which were to be shipped to Union troops with yellow fever. The whole thing did turn out to be a case of mistaken identity. An alias of Tumblety's was remarkably close to a real doctor involved, but it's likely that he would not have been suspected if not for some actions on his part. Tumblety was taken to Washington and imprisoned until the confusion over the plot could be cleared up and he was later released. In the 1870s and 1880s, he made frequent trips to London, which is how the rumors about him being Jack the Ripper got started. Although there has been much debate over the years as to how many victims that Jack the Ripper claimed and just when the murders began, it is generally believed that the first killing occurred on August 31, 1888. 
The victim was a prostitute named Mary Ann Nichols. Her death was followed by those of Annie Chapman and Elizabeth Stride on September 8. On September 30th, the Ripper claimed Catherine Eddowes. Organs had been removed from the bodies of both Chapman and Eddowes, including the latter woman's uterus. Just prior to the start of the murders, Dr. Tumblety had come to London and had taken lodgings in Batty Street, the heart of Whitechapel, and within easy distance of the murder scenes. It is on the record that he was watched closely by the police, especially after an incident involving a pathological museum. During the Annie Chapman inquest, the police began to suspect that the Ripper might be a doctor. One medical examiner believed that the killer had expert anatomical knowledge. He was basing this theory on a witness that claimed the killer was hunting for women's uteruses to sell to an unknown American. This bizarre bit of testimony came about because Tumblety did indeed visit a pathological museum in London and had inquired about any uteruses that might be for sale. He apparently wanted to add them to his collection. On November 7th, Tumblety was arrested, not for murder, but rather for unnatural offenses, which was usually a reference to homosexuality. He was later released on bail, although when exactly that was has been a matter of debate for many years. According to some records, he was released on November 16, but according to others, he was let go on November 8. The entire theory of whether he was Jack the Ripper hinges on the date that he was released from jail. The reason for this is that on November 9, the Ripper claimed his last victim. Her name was Mary Kelly, and she was mutilated in ways that could not be imagined in her own bed. She was butchered beyond recognition, and a number of her organs were removed, including her heart and uterus. If Tumblety was actually released on November 8, then he could have easily killed Mary Kelly. One account of the days following the murder states he was arrested on suspicion of her murder on November 12, was released without being charged, and then vanished from Whitechapel. On November 24, it is alleged that he took a steamer to France and then sailed from France to New York. Scotland Yard detectives were said to have pursued him to New York, and while they kept an eye on him, had no evidence to arrest him. They eventually gave up and went home. Those who do not believe that Tumblety was the Ripper give a different accounting of the days after Mary Kelly was killed. According to these sources, Tumblety was not released on bail until November 16. As Inspector Littlechild wrote, he was then believed to jump bail and escape to Bologna with the police pursuing him. From there, he booked passage to New York, where police staked out his lodgings. He escaped them, however, and vanished. He was not as far as recorded further pursued for his part in the killings. With that said, it would have been impossible for Tumblety to be the Ripper. If he were the killer, then someone would have had to copy and exceed his previous work on Mary Kelly while the doctor was still in jail. Most would agree that this seems highly unlikely. But our story is not quite over. Regardless of what is written about the last days of Tumblety in London, all will agree that after his escape, he did end up in St. Louis. He also traveled for a time, avoiding Washington but visiting Baltimore, New Orleans, and St. Louis. He continued to live in hotels and established no permanent residence in any of the cities. In April 1903, though, Tumblety checked himself into St. John's Hospital and Dispensary at 23rd and Locust Streets in St. Louis. The hospital provided care for indigents. According to accounts, Tumblety was suffering from a long and painful illness. Although what it may have been has never been specifically identified, some have suggested that it may have been a debilitating case of syphilis, a contraction of which might have been cause for his hatred of women, especially prostitutes. Whatever it was, though, Tumblety remained at St. John's until his death on May 28, 1903. However, he was certainly not an indigent when he died. Court records show that Tumblety left an estate of more than $135,000 some of which St. John's managed to recover. The hospital asked for about $450 to cover the room expenses and medical tests for a man who was clearly not poor. The rest of the estate, except for costs to a St. Louis undertaker, went to Tumblety's niece, Mary Fitzsimmons of Rochester, New York. Aside from the hospital, there was one other claim to Tumblety's estate. 
The additional claim was quite strange, especially in light of Tumblety's clear prejudices on the subject. The challenge to a will that Tumblety had written on May 16 came from an attorney in Baltimore named Joseph Kemp. He claimed that Tumblety had written an earlier will in October 1901 that left $1,000 from his estate to the Baltimore Home for Fallen Women. In other words, a halfway house for prostitutes. The claim was thrown out of court, but it does provide an interesting final note to the life of a man who has been suspected of being the most famous killer of prostitutes in history. When Weird Darkness returns, imagine a duel between two women, one a princess, the other a countess. Now, picture them both brandishing swords, slashing at each other. And now, picture them doing so topless. It really happened. And the reason for the duel? A disagreement over flower arrangements. That story is up next. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home? or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. The history of dueling is full of shocking moments, like the time the vice president shot and killed the Secretary of the Treasury. That was, of course, the duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. But no duel was more surprising than the topless duel between a princess and a countess. It was called the first emancipated duel because not only were both duelers women, but their seconds and the doctor on hand to tend their wounds were also women. Female sword duels were uncommon, even by the late 19th century when the topless duel was fought. In the 1892 duel, both women were Austrian noblewomen of the highest ranks. Princess Pauline von Metternich and Countess Anastasia Kielmanseg met with swords to settle a dispute over flower arrangements, and they fought topless for a very good reason. The noblewomen fought according to all the rules of the Code Duello, and both women agreed to abide by the outcome. After all, the duel was not just about flower arrangements, it was also part of the women's rights movement. The duel proved that women could do anything men could do, and they could even do it topless. A beautiful princess charged with organizing a musical and theatrical exhibition and a countess who served as the exhibition's president of the ladies' committee sounds like something out of a whirlwind Victorian novel, 
where witty jokes and perfect manners save the day. But the story of the dueling princess and countess is even wilder than fiction. Princess Pauline von Metternich and Countess Anastasia Kielmansegg were both renowned for their class and taste. They were such strong proponents of correct etiquette that they were willing to shed blood to maintain proper decorum. And in the summer of 1892, the women drew swords and fought history's first all-female duel. And they did it topless. The duel between Princess Pauline and Countess Anastasia is known as the Emancipated Duel. That's because the duel was not only fought between two women, but the women also had female seconds and a completely female medical staff to tend to their wounds. To stick with the noble theme, the seconds were Princess Schwarzenberg and Countess Kinski, and the presiding doctor was Baroness Lubinska, who had a degree in medicine. Dueling had always been connected with honor, which meant masculine honor. Sometimes men fought duels over women's honor if a sister or wife was dishonored, but even that was closely linked with male authority. It was shocking for a duel to feature only women. In fact, news of the duel quickly spread across Europe, with the Paul Mall Gazette running a story with the headline, Report of a Duel Between Two Ladies. The topless duel was a refined affair. Princess Pauline von Metternich had a reputation across Europe for her fashionable taste and elite friends. She was best friends with Empress Eugene France's last reigning empress. And Princess Pauline was also famous for her fashion sense. She grew tired of the enormous crinoline dresses popular in the 1860s and helped change the trend by wearing a fitted dress with a train. Pauline also helped make the German composer Richard Wagner famous, got hot couture off the ground, and was known to smoke cigars. Everything Princess Pauline did was chic, and so was her duel. This wasn't a common street brawl fought between two women trying to rip out each other's hair. The duel was a refined affair, fought with anger or intense passion, and both women agreed to abide by the outcome. The story even made it all the way around the world, where the Los Angeles Times reported it was a real fight and both were wounded, no hair pulling or plain scratching, but a duel with rapiers. Duels were considered serious affairs, but the cause was not always serious. In 1892, both Princess Pauline and Countess Anastasia held positions on the board of the Vienna Musical and Theatrical Exhibition. They apparently disagreed on the exhibition. The duel was reportedly over flower arrangements. But the story is more all about Eve than catfight. By the 1890s, Princess Pauline was in her 50s, and Countess Anastasia was the new up-and-coming woman on the Vienna social scene. According to a British women's magazine, Countess Anastasia was an ambitious young woman, young enough to be the daughter of her rival, Princess Pauline. And while Princess Pauline was in mourning over the death of her husband, Countess Anastasia has come more to the front than ever and has been most indefatigable. Or in modern language, Anastasia was stealing Pauline's position. No wonder the women came to blows. The weapon of choice for the topless duel was a rapier. Rapiers were not battle weapons, in fact, the blade's sides were almost edgeless because rapiers were intended for quick stabs. As weapons expert John Clements says, rapiers are generally thin, light, fast, and well-balanced thrusting swords intended for unarmored single combat. The style of blade became popular in the 1500s, when Europe's courtiers carried rapiers in case they needed to duel or deal with a back-alley challenge, and in fact, the style went hand-in-hand -hand with the rise of dueling. The noble women apparently thought they were perfect for a duel to first blood where the point was to draw blood rather than cause significant harm. The duel between Princess Pauline and Countess Anastasia was fought topless. While it might seem like a strange choice for the women fighting the first emancipated duel to take off their tops, the women did it for a good reason. As they were preparing to duel, another noblewoman, Baroness Lubinska, suggested that the women remove their tops. The Baroness had a medical degree from a university in Poland and she had first-hand experience with the dangers of infection. The princess and the countess did not intend to fight to the death, they chose to fight to first blood instead. So the baroness suggested removing their tops for safety. If the rapiers pushed a piece of dirty cloth into the wound, it could easily become infected. But if the blade only touched bare skin, the women would be safer. On the baroness's orders, 
the princess and the countess ordered their male servants to leave and then stripped to the waist to fight. The princess and the countess met with rapiers to settle their dispute. As their female seconds and Baroness Lubinska watched, the topless women fought each other, swords flying to a draw in the first round. The second round was the same. Neither woman could draw blood, which would signal the end of the duel and crown a winner. But in the third round, both women struck a blow. Countess Anastasia managed to nick the princess's nose, while Princess Pauline drew blood on the countess's arm. The seconds examined the wounds and ruled that the princess was the victor. After the duel, the seconds advised the princess and the countess to embrace, kiss, and make friends. Which, accordingly, they did. Princess Pauline's duel wasn't the first fought between women. In fact, women had been fighting in duels for centuries by the time the princess and the countess came to blows. In 1467, Hans Tollhofer wrote a dueling manual explaining how women could fight in duels. But rather than women fighting other women, Tollhofer imagined that the woman would fight men. To level the playing field, Tollhofer advised that the men should stand in a hole up to his waist. If the woman was able to drag the man out of the hole, she was considered victorious. Dueling evolved a great deal between the 1400s and the 1890s. The emancipated duel proved that women could be just as refined and powerful as men, without changing any of the dueling rules. Dueling might have been centuries old by the 1890s, but women fighting other women in duels was still rare. In some earlier cases, women had asked men to fight duels on their behalf. For example, Severine, a female journalist, asked a male colleague to fight for her to defend an article she had written. However, a movement in the late 19th century pushed new women to fight for themselves. Giselle de Stowe said that if a woman employed a male champion rather than taking up the sword herself, she was committing a deed of inferiority. The duel between the princess and the countess was understood in those terms. The noble women did not need men to fight their battles, nor did they need male seconds. The late 1800s were a heavy time for women's rights in Europe, and the emancipated duel was understood through that lens. Across Europe, the women's suffrage movement demanded the right to vote, but this push for rights was seen as threatening to the old order. As Europe's most famous feminist, Mary Wollstonecraft, argued in A Vindication of the Rights of Women, I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. Many leaders of the women's rights movement were well-off women, either from the aristocracy or the upper middle class. The duel's emancipated nature, using only women as seconds and for medical purposes, carried a strong message about women's capabilities. And yet the same message signaled a terrifying new reality to men of the old order who feared women taking control. Female doctors were still very uncommon in the 1890s. Many places blocked women from attending medical school at all. Some women worked very hard to gain an education. A British army surgeon named James Barry practiced medicine for over 40 years before it was revealed that Barry was actually Margaret Ann Bulkley, masquerading as a man. In fact, it wasn't until after World War I, when the shortage of doctors was particularly dangerous, that the majority of medical schools began admitting women. Baroness Lubinska, the woman who oversaw the duel and tended to the fighter's wounds, wasn't just ahead of her time because she graduated from medical school. She was also an early supporter of germ theory, which argued that germs could cause deadly infections. Dueling wasn't always legal. In fact, by the end of the 19th century, a number of countries had passed strict anti-dueling laws. Even at the beginning of the century, when Aaron Burr shot and killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel, Burr was charged with murder by New York and New Jersey. So the noble women knew they had to be careful about choosing the right location for their duel. As a result, they traveled from Austria to Vaduz Liechtenstein to hold their duel. Liechtenstein was an independent principality that had recently offered sanctuary to the Pope if he ever had to flee the Vatican. Perhaps the princess and the countess knew that the small territory would overlook an illegal duel by two Austrian noblewomen. The topless duel was one of the last major duels in an era that stretched for centuries. The end of the dueling era was partially a response to the bloody wars of the 19th and early 20th centuries. As new battlefield technologies like machine guns and chemical weapons destroyed entire generations of young men, duels suddenly seemed wasteful. 
The decline of the aristocracy also changed the nature of dueling. As social position became more connected with wealth and less with honor or family name, men were less likely to challenge each other to duels. Or perhaps, once women showed that even duels could be emancipated, men just no longer wanted to participate. Up next, Armin Muse placed a personal ad for a volunteer. He was looking for someone to give themselves over to him. To eat. It's one of the most infamous cases of modern cannibalism. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. We've all heard of personal ads. You know, those man-seeking companion or looking-to-adopt-cat ads that vary from relationships to buying home goods and even looking for pets. But what you wouldn't expect to find is an ad looking for someone to eat. Yes, you heard that right. And that's just what Armin Muse did. In 2001, a 39-year-old man named Armin Muse from Rotenburg, Germany, posted an ad on a now-defunct forum called The Cannibal Café. He went by the name Anthropagus, or Frankie, and was looking for a normally built 18-25-year-old to 25 year old to be slaughtered and then consumed. Surprisingly, he found several men who shared his unusual cannibalistic fetish. Muse met several men in hotel rooms where they would role-play the act of cannibalism, but none were willing to actually go through with it in real life. One man even wanted to be beaten to death which was too weird for Muse. It seemed like Muse's search for a willing participant was going nowhere, until he met a user named Kator99 on March 6. This user, whose real name was Bernd Brandis, was a 43-year-old engineer from Berlin. Though not exactly fitting Muse's criteria, Brandis was eager to go through with the plan. Brandis agreed to Muse's gruesome proposal, which included a promise to expertly carve him up after his death and leave very little behind. Brandis was so committed to this plan that he sold all his personal belongings, including a sports car, erased his hard drive, and bought a one-way ticket to meet Muse. When Brandis arrived, the two men stopped at a pharmacy before driving to Muse's house, where they proceeded to have sex. When it was time for the main event, Brandis initially hesitated. However, after taking 20 sleeping pills and drinking a bottle of cough syrup to dull the pain, he was ready they set up a video camera to record everything. Brandis initially wanted Muse to bite off his private parts, but when that didn't work, Muse used a knife to remove them. They attempted to eat it together, but Brandis found it too chewy. Muse then fried the pieces with salt, pepper, wine, garlic, and a bit of Brandis' own fat. Despite his efforts, the cooked flesh was still too tough, so Muse fed it to his dog. Muse then drew Brandis a bath, checked on him every 15 minutes, Knowing that cannibalism wasn't a crime in Germany at the time, but murder was, he hoped that Brandis would regain consciousness and survive. When it became clear that Brandis would not survive, 
Muse finally ended his suffering by stabbing him in the throat. After killing Brandis, Muse hung his body on a meat hook, drained his blood, and carefully carved him up. He stored the meat in meal-sized portions in his freezer, recording the entire process on a four-hour video that has never been released to the public. Muse's first meal was treated as a special occasion. He decorated his table with nice candles, used his best dinner service, and prepared a dish using a piece of Brandis's back. He described the experience as fulfilling a lifelong desire, stating that the flesh tasted like pork but stronger. Over the next 20 months, Muse consumed a total of 44 pounds of Brandis's flesh. Meanwhile, he continued to search for more victims online. It wasn't until December 10, 2001, when an Austrian student reported him to the police, that his gruesome activities came to an end. When police searched his home, they found a false bottom in his freezer containing several pounds of human flesh. Muse initially claimed it was wild boar meat, but the discovery of his videotapes quickly proved otherwise. Armin Muse was diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder but was deemed fit to stand trial. His trial began on December 3, 2003, and on January 30, 2004, he was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to eight years and six months in prison. However, in April 2005, a German court retried Muse, arguing that he should have been tried for murder rather than manslaughter. This time he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. In a surprising twist, Armin Muse has since become a vegetarian. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 4 verse 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And a final thought. Don't be ashamed of your scars. They prove to wounded people that healing is real. Lecrae I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>